saltado de baja la pantalla, vale, porque, ah, vale, porque la presentación la va a cargar directamente en Zoom y esto va a ser una pantalla pequeñita, lo de su cámara. Claro, ese es el problema de que la sala está no está preparada. Puedes dar una plaza al ver porque no tiene. Claro. Ah, sí. Bueno, estamos ya, ¿eh? Todo entonces más o menos lo mismo de sentido. And uh, today we have uh, with us, uh, it's a pleasure to have with us Rafael uh, Guzman from the University of Florida, the Department of uh, Astronomy. Uh, just a few words uh, to introduce him. Uh, he's, uh, he graduated in Universidad Autónoma uh, Complutense for the of Madrid and uh, in physics and astronomy. And then he uh, moved to Durham to do the PhD there. And uh, his first uh, postdoc was uh, uh, at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And he was uh, working with the uh, deep uh, stochastic uh, evolutionary probe that's right time and uh, then uh, he got the uh, award of the uh, Hubble fellowship uh, he, he moved to Yale University and uh, after that just uh, he finished in, in, in University of Florida uh, department of uh, astronomy in uh, where he is still there and uh, he also received the uh, well, first, uh, he, an interesting part of his curriculum is uh, that he is the co-founder co of uh, a company called uh, Satlantis, uh, that is, uh, uh, at least originally was a, a spin-off from the University of Florida, but um, the headquarters are in Lebanon. now. And, uh, well, you will hear more about uh, what he does there. Uh, and he has received several awards, uh, about, I think, uh, faculty award in, at the University of Florida. I understood that you, you have uh, several uh, awards uh, for uh, also teaching, education, uh, and as professor there. And uh, just uh, it's a very long and rich career in the case with many publications, and you, you all know it. So I, I think you, you can start. Thank you, Enrique. <laughs> I feel very old now. Um, <laughs> So thanks very much actually to all of you and especially to you Enrique for giving us to Alvaro and myself the opportunity to tell you about this um, new project that, you, that we are um, starting. Um, well, I say starting even though it has been quite a few years in the making, but now is gaining a new momentum with the support both of the Spanish government and also of the University of Florida. Um, the project is called DOOMS, that stands for Dark Matter Unveiled, uh, using the new Explorer satellite. Um, and, uh, and as you will see in a minute, um, we're trying to provide the necessary data to carry out the definitive test uh, that can unveil the nature of dark matter, mainly whether dark matter is cold or it is warm 
or what it will be the um, the new um, the new form of dark matter that can actually reproduce the properties of the universe over a wide range of scales. So just to start with, um, modern cosmology as we as we know it is a relatively new area of research in astrophysics. It's about uh, less than 100 years old. And in these 100 years, we have learned quite a lot about, about the universe, starting, of course, that the universe is made up of galaxies, that the universe is expanding, that not only is expanding, but it's accelerating. And the most perhaps surprising result of all is that uh, we know very, very little of the universe itself. About 5% is just in the form of the basic atoms, molecules, and radiation that we understand with our laws of physics. And the rest, the 95%, uh, is actually in the form either in a mysterious dark matter, about 25%, that we know that it is there because it is still uh, can um, uh, follow the laws of gravity, or an even more mysterious um, substance that we call dark energy, about 70% of all the mass and energy there is in the universe, that we really have no idea what it is except that it has um, a properties equivalent to a repulsive force that is accelerating the universe itself. Now, despite all these discoveries and despite the uh, peculiar situation that we are in modern cosmology at the moment, um, you can see the, some of the people that have contributed the most to the, to the new paradigm, the cosmological model that we call Lambda CDM, that stands precisely for the type of uh, uh, substances that uh, we believe uh, can describe very well the behavior of dark matter and dark energy. And these are some of the Nobel Prizes awarded in physics of the people that have made these major contributions. Now, in addition to these, um, <clears throat> to these observations, um, there have been also a great progress in the supercomputers, particularly in the simulations of an entire volumes representative of the universe um, in the last 20 years. And here you have the Millennium Simulation that, that definitely set the standard uh, before and after um, due to the complexity and the detail of this simulation. In this case, mainly dark matter, but it already provided the first um, computer simulated universe that really reproduce very, very well the statistical properties of the universe as a whole. Particularly this type of a filamentary structure that you can see, uh, this is again the distribution of dark matter, that it is not random, it's not Gaussian. And in the, in the intersection of these filaments is where you have the highest concentrations of, of matter uh, yielding the creation of uh, superclusters of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and eventually galaxies uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I should go a little bit there. Yes. Okay. Uh, is this a little bit better? Let's see. Okay. Yes. So now the beauty of these simulations, as, as I was saying, is that you can actually reproduce very, very well the statistical properties of the universe over a wide range of scales, typically about uh, three to four orders of magnitude, going from a thousand megaparsecs to very much of the order of a few megaparsecs, right? Now, this was done with dark matter, but now in the last few years, we have had now an even more sophisticated simulations, in this case from the Illustris team, uh, in which not only they can reproduce what it is a distribution in the larger scale of dark matter alone, but also how the over dense regions uh, are populated by variants and how the variants eventually will transform in order to uh, produce the stars and galaxies that we see today. And this is introducing um, magnetic fields, introducing gas dissipation and hydrodynamics. And also very important, as you can see, or you will see in a minute, um, some of the effects of the uh, feedback due to the explosion of the supernovas after the stellar evolution. We're really talking about the most sophisticated cosmological models done so far, that they confirm the same type of overall statistical properties of, of the universe. And not only you can do that at the scales that are very representative, maybe I will, if I move, maybe they will not see me, sorry about that. So 
here on the on the um, bottom left, you can see detailed simulations of single galaxies, right? So not only you can describe the universe over a very large scale, but also at the scales of single galaxies with exquisite detail, right? Now, perhaps the best way to summarize all this information, the models and the data is through this uh, seminal uh, result that shows the power spectrum of the density fluctuations of mass and energy as a function of the scale. Whether here on the bottom left, you can see, well, maybe it's not that important that they see me, I can just move so that people will be able to, to see better. So over here, you can see then uh, larger scales in the universe. And over here, you can see the smaller scales of the universe. Now you can have a wide variety of measurements starting from the large scale structure data derived from the CMB fluctuations. You are, you are experts on this, on this work with many, many experts actually here in the audience. Um, all the way to what it is, the distribution of galaxies in these major relative surveys. And over uh, again four orders of magnitudes in terms of the size of, the, of these characteristic scales, and in pink you can see the best fitting line of this cosmological model that corresponds to the so-called lambda CDM, where lambda is the term that accounts for the uh, nature of dark energy, and the CDM is the particular flavor of dark matter that is cold, meaning mainly big particles that move slowly. And you can see that the agreement is excellent, again, over close to four orders of magnitude, representing the statistical properties of the universe itself. However, the same model fails miserably on the smallest scales, at the scales of a single galaxy haters, where you can see that uh, it over predicts the amount of structure and sorry, I just uh, wanted to. Hmm, this is not doing what I wanted. Uh, sorry about that. And here you can see in this um, simulation using cold dark matter a characteristic halo of a single galaxy. And you can see the very large number of uh, sub halos, the substructure, represented here also in this prediction in the power spectrum. And as you will see in a minute, these uh, very large number of uh, small systems, uh, small satellites around the, the central galaxy are simply not seen. And that is the single uh, most important failure of the CDM model. A model that I emphasize otherwise reproduce very, very well the properties of the universe as a whole. And here you have Simon White and Carlos Frank that in their seminal paper in 1980 something, uh, they actually proposed the model of cold dark matter. They have been considered for the Nobel Prize several times. And some people think that because of this failure in the predictions of CDM compared to the observations, they may not have been awarded the Nobel Prize. They themselves actually said that the statistics of the satellites of these small stellar systems around, orbiting around the big galaxies the size of the Milky Way, as well as the statistics of the type of the tidal streams, you will see in a minute what I refer to as tidal streams, provide the best observational evidence or test of the nature of dark matter. And why are they saying this? Well, first, because if you just look at what we can see in the halos of Milky Way type galaxies, and again, this is just a sketch, these are the actual observations is the number of satellites as a function of mass, whether it is in M31, the Milky Way, or in the local group. And in color, you can see the histogram of these satellites as compared to the gray predictions of the cold dark matter model. And you can see that there is a difference that is an order of magnitude larger in terms of the predictions compared to the actual observations. Um, and this is what the CDM model predicts, again, very similar to this sketch that I just showed here. In order to reduce the number of satellites, you have to change the flavor of dark matter and move into different versions of dark matter, for example, warm dark matter, uh, particles that will be smaller and will be moving faster, and therefore reducing the amount of clustering or subclustering in the halos of galaxies. 
but this is only one possibility. Um, there's also the possibility that the, we are not looking deep enough, and that's why we are not seeing these satellites. Right? They may be there, and it's simply a selection effect. You really have to go very, very deep in order to be able to detect them. But why the tidal streams? Because um, as Simon and, uh, and Carlos uh, also were able to demonstrate as part of the CDM theory of galaxy uh, formation and evolution, and they can, with the hierarchical clustering or hierarchical galaxy assembly, a scenario in which large galaxies like the Milky Way form through the mergers of a smaller uh, stellar systems throughout the whole time. Here you can see again one of those simulations by the Durham group. Uh, and here you can see that as this, uh, let me see if it is, yes. As these uh, small systems, in this case, just uh, uh, focus on the green uh, structure over here. This is a small dwarf galaxy <laughs> orbiting, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, orbiting um, the, the massive galaxy. And eventually due to the tidal forces it will get disrupted and the stars will actually be stretched over the orbit. And that's what we call the stellar streams, right? So it is important to take into account that first, in trying to reconcile the observations with the models, we may have a selection problem because we're not observing deep enough. The objects may still be there, but we have not seen them because we have not looked again uh, with the adequate depth in our observations. Second, they may have been there, but they also may have actually merged with the, uh, with the larger galaxy. Um, and you can have at least a sense of what is the rate of these mergers precisely through the statistics of these type of streams. And also third, um, they may still be there, but they are dark subhalos. They never formed the stars. They are still there, but you cannot see them because they do not uh, um, manage to get a variance that eventually transform into stars and shine light. And this is something that we can also test by studying the shape of these tidal streams, as you can see in this example. Because if you have uh, subhalo structures, even dark matter subhalos, they will interact with the thin tidal streams and they will heat up the streams so they will become broader. And also there will be some substantial gaps in the, in the tidal streams. So that's why Simon and Carlos said that the um, survey statistical properties of the tidal streams could provide the very best test on whether dark matter is cold or not, right? Now, um, there have been now several attempts from the ground to do this type of observations. They are not easy at all. And perhaps the pioneer work by the PANDA survey um, studying the halo of M31. Here you can see M31 in visible. And now for a scale, you can see now the deepest observation of M31 that does reveal this extended halo and these features that correspond to the tidal streams and a bunch of new um, dwarf galaxies that were uh, that they were discovered. But they were not near enough to be able to reconcile the, the predictions of the models with the actual observations. You really have to go much deeper. Um, here you have the state of the art of the, the survey of these galaxy halos that has been done from the ground, done by our colleague David Martinez Delgado at the IA. At the IA. Um, this is about 15 years of, of work summarized in this, um, in this set of images. And you can see again for all these Milky Way type galaxies that show these extended halos, and many of them have all these uh, tidal streams. This is, of course, the, the, the most recognizable one with different shapes that are very, very similar to the predictions of the shapes in these tidal streams or stellar streams of the CDM model. But again, even though this is the state of the art that can be done from the ground, it's not deep enough. You're reaching of the order of 28 to 29 magnitudes per square second. You really have to go beyond 31 magnitudes per square second if you really want to probe with a statistically representative uh, sample of tidal strings per galaxy plus the number of galaxies 
in order to be able to discriminate between the, the predictions of CDM or any other type of dark matter model. So I also want to highlight that it's very difficult. These are panchromatic uh, images. It's very difficult to get uh, color images because you really have to double the, the observing time. But for the few that uh, have been observed in different bands, you can see that the stellar streams tend to be very, very red. And that is important as we prepare for the survey that we would like to propose. Another thing that is important to take into account is that we are talking about surface brightness. It's not about point sources. And when you talk about uh, surface brightness, then the figure of merit that is actually represented here um, implies that you can do a very, very efficient survey at a very, very low surface brightness using a small telescope with a wide field of view. That is the key thing. It's not point sources. We're talking about surface brightness. Um, and, and here you can see as an example that just a small 20 centimeter diameter commercial telescope very, very fast at F2, has the same light gathering power than the GDC, which is the largest telescope in visible and infrared um, uh, here on the ground. Um, however, because of the difference in the field of view, it is much more efficient to carry out the survey using a small 20 centimeter telescope with these characteristics than using the GDC. So this is a survey that that does not require, in fact, is much better done with the small telescopes instead of a large telescopes. Another thing that I want to emphasize here in these simulations of the outer regions of the halo of galaxies, that if you consider the distribution of the stars and the light invisible and in short with infrared, this is about uh, going down to 1.7 microns, so there will be no need for cryogenics. Um, um, you can be much more efficient observing in the infrared than in the visible. They may look the extension of the stars more or less the same, but look at the scale. It's about a factor of 10 brighter in the infrared than it is in the, in the visible. That's why they are so red, right? So with all this information, what we did is, okay, um, let's, why don't we put a small telescope above the atmosphere, we can remove the sky background, which is by far the largest contributor to the noise. And therefore we can actually reach the very low surface brightness that we need in order to carry out this test. I, sorry. Yeah. I think that's okay. Um, so um, we, we could do it not only in the visible, but also specifically in the infrared. And in the visible, we can actually reach about 32 magnitudes per square second. And that is about 10 times deeper than what has already been done from the ground. But in the infrared, and we can reach a very similar depth uh, from above the atmosphere, that is completely unique. There's nothing that comes close to such a very, very deep survey in the in infrared. Um, so in only five years, we could actually uh, survey about 200 square degrees. Uh, typically, the field of view of this camera will be about one square degree. And we're talking about, as you will see, uh, 200 hours exposure per, uh, per galaxy. Um, in order to provide uh, about 200 galaxy halos, that is about almost an order of magnitude larger than has ever been done from the ground. And this only in five years instead of uh, in 15 years. So those are the advantages. So now we're putting together the consortium. Uh, here in Spain, we have the Instituto Astrofísico Andalucía, Complutense de Madrid. And we also have the IEC in, in Barcelona. Um, and of course, this is why um, as we assembled the consortium, we thought that it would be uh, of interest for some of you here at IFCA uh, to be able to, uh, to join also in this consortium. Uh, first, because of the expertise in, in dark matter and in particle physics, and also because of the expertise on some specific techniques on dealing with image processing and statistical descriptors when you have very, very low signal to noise and you are, determined the, uh, you are limited by the systematics of your instrument. Now, this is from Spain. Um, for the reasons that you will see uh, towards the end of the, of the uh, talk, uh, of course, we are also establishing the collaboration with the United States that is very much led by the University of Florida, MIT, and NASA Ames, um, with very much an emphasis on the predictions from the illustrious uh, uh, simulations and 
in terms of the mission analysis and the image processing. Of course, we continue the collaboration with the University of Durham, where Carlos Frank is at, and uh, CETA, the Center for Direct Theoretical Astrophysics and Cosmology in Zurich, where Ben Moore is the director, using the state-of-the-art um, galaxy halos, uh, uh, very detailed simulations, um, particularly for defining the statistical descriptors, the, the shapes, the numbers, uh, the characteristics of the stellar streams, which is, again, not an easy task. Um, and then we have quite a few institutions that, uh, from the industry that would provide uh, some of the technological solutions that we will need in order to implement this, uh, this, um, this mission. Satlantis, uh, the company responsible for the camera, uh, you will see in a, in a minute. Uh, Tyvek for the microsatellites in, in the United States. Uh, Airbus or AHP uh, for providing the, the large mini satellite here in Europe and the INTA as mission operations. Um, so the first thing is that um, we would love actually, and this is an open invitation to IFCA to be able to join the consortium, if there would be uh, interest in any of you actually to be part of this mission. Now, we did some preliminary um, uh, mission analysis. This is very simple. The idea is simply to launch the uh, small satellite, whether a microsatellite or a mini satellite, in the sun synchronous orbit, and in, this is a very stable configuration because you will always have the satellite looking out in the direction of the anti-sun. Um, well, you will have the solar panels always facing the sun. Again, thermally very, very stable. And you have a viewing angle about 50 degrees in which you can continuously be taking images, right? For five years, that corresponds to 200 hours per galaxy. That corresponds roughly to about 400 uh, sorry, about 200 uh, square degrees or 200 galaxy halos. Um, and now, of course, we have to design the camera. Um, and what we wanted to do is to design a camera that will be very, very, very simple, very robust, but with an optimal image quality. And that is the concept that we came up with. Uh, it's called ISIM. ISIM stands for, for <clears throat> Integrated Standard Imaging for Microsatellites. And as you can see, it's a binocular camera where one of the two telescopes is optimized in the visible wavelengths and the other one in the infrared. There are no moving parts. Uh, there are no, um, uh, again, no filter wheels. Uh, and it's a very, very simple um, optical design. It's a modified Maxud of Cassegrain, as you can see here. You have the corrector lens, the primary mirror, and the field lens over here only three optical elements, all of them with the spectral surfaces. And despite the simplicity of the optical design, it provides uh, diffraction-limited images all the way from 450 nanometers to 1.7 microns over the entire uh, field of view, which is close to one degree. That is the beauty of it. Um, and the fact that they are all the spherical surfaces, and there are only three, and it's on axis, makes this camera much, much easier to fabricate and much, much easier to align, right? Well, the second thing is the structure is quasi thermal. You can see that there are two aluminum plates holding the corrector lenses and the primary mirrors. They're joined together by um, these carbon fiber rods with titanium fittings. And that means that you can maintain the diffraction limited quality of the images, even if you have a variation of about 14 degrees in within the, the environment of the camera. Uh, in any case, in order to, man to prevent further gradients, we also have introduced some heaters that will allow us to control actively any major differences between the camera. But just on its own, it maintains this excellent optical quality because of the, the, optical stru the mechanical structure. Now, the third thing is that we're introducing these focal plane arrays is commercially of the shelf but we actually rigorize and specialize these, um, these sensors. We're using SCMOS for the, for the visible and in indium gallium arsenide detectors for the infrared. Again, without the need of cryogenics because we are stopping at 1.7 microns. So we, we get them from the US, from Israel, and, uh, and then we actually do the the, the changes needed so that they will withstand the operations in the space. And finally, the electronics, which are fully developed in, in Atlantis. Um, 
this uh, a very sophisticated actually um, electronics that incorporate the latest FPGAs and GPUs in order to be able to handle the data rates. Uh, um, I'll come back to this in a minute because um, even though I'm saying that this is a very, very simple camera, it took us actually three attempts uh, to, to be able to come up with this model. We failed miserably in the first two. Uh, first with the coatings of the optics in the Kennedy Space Center during vibration tests, sorry, during the thermal vacuum tests. And second, in the mechanical structure also in Kennedy, um, in which the whole camera was destroyed. And honestly, I mean, for those of you working in instrumentation, it's a very disheartening when you can see years of effort suddenly going nowhere. So at that point also, we ran out of um, the initial seed funds that the University of Florida provided. So we decided to, to tap onto an untapped source of funding, which is your own lifetime savings. And we decided to create Atlantis um, because Atlantis um, is a company that uses this camera for commercial applications. And we realized early on that this camera had some characteristics that made it very, very competitive when using the camera, not just to looking out into the universe, but looking down onto the earth. And I just simply highlighting here three. The first one is that we're using the same algorithms for super resolution that we used in the Hubble Deep Field with a dithering uh, technique, and that we can actually improve the diffraction limit in the special resolution by a factor of two or three below the diffraction limit. Again, something that people did not think it was possible, and we were able to demonstrate as you will see in a minute. The second thing is that. Now for Earth observations, we can put several filters as you scan the surface of the Earth uh, with the orbital motion of satellite. And then the image quality, the spatial resolution is independent of the number of filters. In the traditional uh, camera solution, if you have four filters, your spatial resolution is degraded by factor four. We can put 10 filters, 20 filters, in maintaining the same spatial resolution were very much limited by the huge amount of uh, data that we generate of the order of one gigabit per second with only four filters. Um, and then the, the third thing is agility. Our camera is the only one that because we're taking images very, very quickly, every 0.2.3 milliseconds, um, um, we can actually take the, the images while the satellite moves not only along the orbit, but also across the orbit. And therefore, you can follow very efficiently irregular linear structures on Earth that you cannot do with a traditional scanning camera of, uh, of the traditional and larger satellites. Um, these irregular structures, like uh, coastlines for environmental studies, or uh, borders for safety, or um, pipelines, for, for example, for leaks and so on. So that's very much what, uh, with this new approach, we were able to continue the work on the ISIM camera project. And we came up now in Atlantis with three different models. All of them are based on the same concept. So the smallest type of camera is ISIM 90, where 90 stands for the, um, the diameter in millimeters of the primary mirror. And this is an ideal camera for the new generation of CubeSats. Uh, Imagine that you're familiar with the CubeSat uh, 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 notation, right? Uh, one CubeSat is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Um, in this case, I'm hablando of the 16 units, 16 new uh, CubeSats for this type of uh, cameras. That provide, by the way, about two meters in um, visible and, and panchromatic. Just to give you an idea, we can actually assemble, align, and test this camera in only two weeks now in Atlantis. And if you're familiar with the, uh, the mission Ingenio, which was the uh, flagship um, satellite for Earth observation of the Spanish government, it took many years, uh, over 300 million uh, euros. Um, it provided actually uh, two meters in panchromatic, but about five meters in, in the visible. And then it was extremely difficult to align. Just, just to give you an idea of how things have changed, how quickly they have changed because of miniaturization and also because of a new way of, uh, of approaching access to space. Now, ISIM 170 is um, the intermediate size camera, and ISIM 300 is the largest size that we can actually uh, build while maintaining the same uh, optomechanical uh, 
design. Okay, something that is also very important. So you saw that the figure of Nelly, uh, uh, depending on the F number, square, and the smaller the, the F number, the, the more efficient your system will be when trying to detect very low surface brightness. In our case, we have an F10. So um, you may think, well, um, if you go to an F2, you're going to have a huge improvement in your ability to detect uh, very low surface brightness. Yes, but, uh, but it's very difficult to have a camera with such a very fast uh, F number and being able to maintain a stable and, and very well-defined PSF all across the field of view and um, being diffraction limited. And that's what we have done. This is at the actual PSF of the camera. This is over several orders of magnitude. You can see all the diffraction rings here. And, uh, and the nice thing that is very, very stable everywhere in the field of view. And we need it because you will need to decompose from the PSF from all the underlying structure in the universe if you really want to see the very, very faint structure of the tidal streams in your field of view, right? So, of course, we will have to add exposure time in order to reach the, the surface brightness, but we, we can do it. We can, we, can, we can have 200 hours on target, as you will see, in order to reach the 32 magnitudes per square second. So that's the very first thing of the camera. The second thing is that our camera is, is, um, is an axial uh, design, right? It's on axis. <clears throat> and as such, therefore you have an obscuration and a hole in the primary mirror, right? And if you look at the modulation of the transfer function, this is the Fourier transform of the PSF. Instead of having something like this, that you will have yeah, if you had an old reflective system with no obscuration, and you have this drop in the, in the special frequencies, at the intermediate special frequencies, right, in MTF. MTF gives you the contrast, the ability to see details where you have very faint detail next to a very bright uh, object, and you can distinguish the two of them with very good signal to noise, right? Um, but as you can see, we are actually having this drop, and this is absolutely natural. It is, uh, it is, um, I mean, associated to the, the presence of this obscuration in the design. But remember that I told you that what we do is to apply the same dithering technique in order to implement super resolution algorithms. And in the process, not only we gain signal to noise, we gain a special resolution, but we also improve the NTF. And here you can see, again, this is the actual MTF measured in our lab of the camera. And this is the final MTF up to the super resolution algorithms in the four bands. And now you can see that we recover again the, the characteristic MTF uh, um, shape of an unobstructed uh, optical design. So again, th this is just simply to let you know that a very, very simple camera in a smart way for the observational strategy can reproduce these really, really good results that you need if you want to reach uh, these very low surface planes. Now, um, so the camera has been validated in space. Uh, here you have the flight model of ICIM 170. That was the first camera that we launched to the International Space Station last year in May with JAXA. And I have to tell you that for those of you that have been either working for many years in an instrumentation project or particularly in a, in a space mission, um, the, the moment of the launch and the validation of your, of your technology in a space, it is one of the, the best moments of your life. So we completed the, the, the camera, the flight model through um, a grant that we got from the European Union. And I'm very pleased that after reviewing the results, the, the reviewing committee uh, uh, valued extremely well, actually, the outcome of our work. <coughs> like uh, the team of Atlantis has demonstrated a high level of professionalism, blah, blah, blah. But, it, but we were really, really pleased, not only with the review, but particularly with the results. So here you have a raw image of Teide uh, taken with the camera with, uh, from the ISS, right? About 20,000 kilometers an hour. Um, and again, there's no, this is just raw, but it tells you the quality of the image of a single image, right? 
And, and also that there is no scattered light. You don't see a straight light. You don't see any any uh, degradation of the of the image in the in the in the borders. Now I'm going to show you the the images after image processing. So here you have the sequences. Remember that we're taking several images of the same location on Earth with very short exposure times. We resample, combine, add, and decompose. Right, that's what goes into the super resolution technique. So here you have an airport near San Diego, and, and you may recognize the Bay Area in San Francisco, right? So if we just zoom in, uh, and this is sorry, the moment of the launch from Tanegashima, and this was the moment in which the the camera that is at the end of this robotic arm was installed on the outside uh, Kibo uh, platform of the uh, of the International Space Station. It was it was actually done by Commander Chris Cassidy, that in real time was speaking to Kim uh, Philippes, uh, Philippes Esther. Um, and, and it was funny because it was a bit of a delay. So they were talking and the Kim will ask him, well, uh, how are you doing? And uh, how is life in the ISS? But then um, the commander said, um, Okay, all is good for uh, here. How are you, Kim? Um, not much of a protocol in their in their uh, in their conversation. Okay, going back to the um, the image quality. So here you see the same airport, and if you zoom in, you can see, of course, the um, the separation in the stripes in the in the runway. You can see that the airplanes in the tarmac are four engine uh, airplanes, and most importantly, you can recognize the helicopters and even see the blades in the helicopters, right, which are about 80 centimeters in width. So uh, this is just an example of images to, uh, to demonstrate that we were able to achieve sub-meter resolution from the ISS with this very small camera. It's about this bit, 170 millimeters diameter. Right? Okay, now um, with the first uh, mission to the ISS, we were able to demonstrate uh, super resolution. Remember that there were two other innovations in the camera concept, which was multi-spectrality without loss of special resolution and agility. And that's what we're testing in the second camera. This time is IC90, the small one, that will be launched uh, to the ISS with NASA this December. Uh, uh, with the SpaceX. And here you can see the flight model, and this is where they will be located in a sort of a gimbal that will allow it to move perpendicular to the orbital direction of the, of the ISS. And this, is, this was done <clears throat> um, uh, uh, in collaboration with NASA and the Air Force Research Lab. And again, I'm very pleased that um, the STP uh, program that we were selected actually for the launch of the ISS already referred to CASPER, which is uh, the name of our mission as the gold standard of this type of project. So very, very pleased with the evaluation of the external uh, committees. And finally, I want to show you ISIN 300. Um, this is again, the largest camera. We were awarded um, a contract with European Union, in this case for defense, because they're very interested in, in about 50 centimeters resolution. And for that, you really need uh, this larger camera. And um, this was the feasibility study that we did in collaboration with uh, several uh, institutions in Europe. And again, um, this came from, um, um, the, um, from the military and the, the GAN uh, here in Spain. They said it has been, um, I mean, uh, it's been one of the most interesting projects, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this was the feasibility study, but because of the success of the feasibility study, we have been awarded now the NEMOS project, which is, um, in collaboration with a major consortium of space uh, industry in Europe, how we can actually mount ISIM 300 on an astrophane uh, microsat in order to be able to demonstrate again the super resolution agility and multispectrality um, when looking down on Earth. Why well, I'm showing this because this is the technology that we want to use now that it has been validated in space for uh, the DOOMS mission. Let me just simply show you that even for ISIM 300, we have already uh, demonstrated that, um, that such um, lenses can be published with the quality that you need. In this case, uh, from Optimax, the, the US based company. These are again the sensors that we are considering for the DOOMS mission uh, ESIMOS from Teledyne in the visible and INGAS from SED in, in the infrared. And then the electronics have already been designed fully in Atlantis. Okay, so for Dooms, 
we decided to focus on nice in 170 again already validated at the ISS and and um, what we did first is um, to see um, whether we would be able to reach the, the low surface brightness that it was needed and this was the very first um, um, tests that we did at the University of Florida, taking an eagle simulation. It was purely dark matter and then um, some kind of a um, very simplistic uh, transformation um, into matter into light, just to have a sense of whether we could actually reach this low surface brightness or not. And uh, you can see that only in 100 hours, in this very simple exercise that we did some time ago, we could actually get, again, the central galaxies, this bright disk in the here in the middle, and then you can see the, the structure that you can see um, down to the level again that, that is required to do the test. But that was again the, the initial uh, simulations. Now we have done more sophisticated simulations. In this case, we took the Garrocha models from Complutense, um, Santi Roca et al., and uh, that they have a very, very uh, high spatial resolution of single galaxy halos, as you can see in this case. And, uh, and see how they would look like considering um, other effects uh, like uh, galactic extinction and of course the contamination by the zodiacal light. And, uh, and the result was that you can actually reach about 33 magnitudes per square arc second. Um, now this is still something missing. And what is missing is a realistic background now against these models will have to be tested. And we are doing this. We're doing this with Alex Bodlaf at NASA Ames, who has already done all this work for the nuclear dimension. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, using Illustris, a, simula a simulation of the current depth of the slow and the sky survey at about 27 magnitudes per square second. This will be the Dragonfly depth, and Dragonfly is um, it's a similar project to the one that David has been carrying out um, from Spain, in this case, a collaboration between Canada and the United States. This is um, how it would look like actually for um, some of the deepest images taken over a wide area from the ground, in this case from CFHD at about 29 magnets per square second. This is also the depth of David's uh, survey. Um, and this, sorry, uh, this is now uh, the depth of Euclid at about 30 magnitudes per square second, um, but about half the sky. However, we are planning to go to 32 magnitudes per square second, and this is how the, the universe looks like at this very, very faint level. Remember that you need to subtract all this structure in order to see the structure that you want to see in the foreground of the galaxy halo. Right? And that's why it's so important that you understand the systematics of the instrument, but also that the PSF is stable all across the field of view, because you will have to remove the very high orders of the diffraction range in order to make sure that you are not confusing the remnants of your PSF with the actual tidal streams in the galaxy. Um, this mission is very complementary to Euclid, and, and that's uh, what we have already been discussing with IEC. IEC, as you can see, is a leading Spanish institution in the Euclid survey. Um, Euclid, of course, aims to uh, understand what is the nature of dark energy and dark matter, but using uh, images like this, mainly um, um, micro lensing and, and the shape of galaxies all the way to redshift three, um, in order to determine well, together with the redshifts what is the, the evolution in the, uh, in the expansion of the universe and therefore the acceleration of the universe itself. This is a characteristic image of, of Dunes. Very, very different, but very complementary in a completely different uh, uh, scale, but being able to constrain what is the nature of dark matter. And again, we are now collaborating so that we can actually uh, strengthen uh, the DOOM mission as a complementary to the cosmological uh, questions to be answered also with you. Um, here is in the surface, limited surface brightness versus area where DOOMs will be at. Again, a unique part of the parameter space. And just to give you an idea, the 40 square degrees that Euclid will have at the deepest survey 
will actually come comparable in the in surface brightness, but obviously uh, almost an order of magnitude less in the in area. That's why it is so important to have the 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 statistical um, data set that Dunes will provide. Okay, so just to finish a little bit the the roadmap. So the idea was originally to uh, submit a proposal to the Pioneer program at NASA which is specifically uh, intended for um, astrophysics missions with small satellites. So um, what we did is just uh, to make a presentation to CDPI because um, CDPI was interested in collaborating with the United States in the pioneer proposal through the PRODEX program. Uh, so the idea was we will apply for PRODEX phase, phase A, a feasibility study, um, with that ongoing, we will apply for Pioneer, and then if Pioneer is awarded, Spain then had committed to contribute actually towards this mission, particularly with um, the camera development. So that was the original uh, plan. And um, just to let you know that um, the products face a um, announcement for uh, proposals will come uh, before the end of this year, and that Pioneer will actually be due in mid next year. So we're talking about a very short time scale. Um, however, when we made the presentation to the city, CDPI, they really, really liked this uh, project. And, and as you know, CDPI has been trying to, um, to encourage that there will be a space mission led by Spain. And they are encouraging us to consider uh, Dunes as a candidate for an F mission. So, um, in order to uh, go there, we would like actually to use the, the Pioneer uh, proposal as a pathfinder towards the ultimate goal that it will be Dunes as, a, as an F mission. Um, we, in this case, instead of using ISIN 170, we will be using the ISIN 300. Are most likely a platform similar to that of the Astroboost platform by Airbus. This is the same uh, mini satellite that has been used by Airbus so successfully in Chaos. Because something that is very, very important is that we need to secure the pointing stability of the platform during the characteristic 15 to 20, uh, sorry, 15 minutes exposure per frame that we will have in this case. Uh, now we are assembling the consortium. And um, on the European side, um, we have built the, the construction around the uh, Switzerland and Spain axis, because that was also a very successful collaboration in Chaos. And they have responded very, very positively, both at the scientific and the technological level. Now, we are expanding with Sweden. And, and of course, remember, the United States will remain also as a collaborator leading the the efforts through NASA, while uh, we, the European Consortium, will be able to lead the European the the, uh, the efforts through ESA. Um, so just to finish again, this uh, the roadmap looks now a little bit more difficult. Um, I mean, more difficult in the sense more complex, because in addition to the first uh, three steps, now we have to prepare for what it will be um, the uh, ESA F mission. Uh, phase A or B, and then if we're awarded towards the completion of the, of the mission later on. But these are completely different time scales. We're talking about seven years for Pioneer and about 10, 15 years for the F mission. And they are started with the goal that one can support and strengthen the other. And just to finish, I wanted to also invite you to what it will be the first proposal that we would like to submit, which is for products phase A, that will be the feasibility study. We have done a lot uh, regarding the simulations of the science case and the demonstration of the technology in the space. But there are a couple of things that we still would like actually to demonstrate with this feasibility study, particularly the, um, the completion of the simulations, including the very realistic background and taking into account the, the systematics of the, of the sensors and the instrument itself in low Earth orbit. And the, um, and the demonstration that we can do a feedback, a closed loop between the um, pointing of the camera itself and the pointing of the um, and stability of the pointing of the platform through the start tracker and the attitude control. 
Again, it has already been solved for Kelps, but we want to incorporate that, uh, that, this, that uh, solution into our mission. And that's why I also would like, if there were interest here in IFCA, to be able to, to invite you to participate as we prepare for these initial stages of the DOOMS mission. And with this, I will finish and thank you very much for your interest. Uh, about, uh, the questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's about 4 o'clock. I don't know if you start at 7 o'clock. Oh, no, it's 1.30 at the end. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, the first. Yes. So, uh, when you show the matter was before, so June will form this case, which are where the prediction. Exactly. It will focus exclusively on the scales of single galaxy tables, precisely whether you have the disagreement of an order of magnitude between observations, current observations, and the model. And, and this uh, discrepancy, is it, sorry, uh, it's a nice question. So, at small scale, I guess that like, we can have a non linear effect, etc. Uh, the, sometimes we, we, we speak about the deficit of power because of massive neutrinos, etc. The reason for this discrepancy can be because of all these reasons or, or more specific reasons? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, there have been many, many different ways to try to explain the, the discrepancy. But at the end of the day, cold dark matter over predicts the number of substructure in the smallest scales. And and it's not seen, again, it's not seen because of a number of factors, right, that, that need to be tested, but it's not, it's not seen. Yeah. And, and it is clear that there's no way out. If you want to ensure that cold dark matter is able to reproduce the statistical properties over all the other scales of the universe, all the way till the CMB, you fail in the, in the single galaxy failures with the current observations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, so you were talking about uh, using stellar streams to probe the nature of dark matter. What would this give us that we don't already have looking at stellar streams in the Milky Way with Gaia, for example? Yes. Well, it gives you the statistics because it is it is not trivial. I mean, remember that stellar stream. Um, uh, depends also on the time scales because eventually they they actually evolve and um, and your detectability will be even lower. Um, so you need large samples so that you can build. It's always a statistical test, right? Whether or not you have a real difference between the predictions overall, right, and the um, the average pro properties of many galaxy values, right? So you go, you need to go deeper so that you can see many more per galaxy if they are there, and you need many more galaxies. A single one will not, you, you have not enough um, discriminatory power to be able to differentiate. In, in the case of the, the tidal streams, what exactly is, is the thing that you're looking for? Is it, is it structure within the stream, which is usually what we think about? From that, that is a very good question. That, it really is a very good question. It's a question that I posed to Carlos and his team in Durham. And, um, and we hide the answer through a word there that we use, a statistical descriptor, right? Because what is the statistical descriptor? And you're completely right. So what, what are we measuring? So it's a combination of um, number, shape, length, um, and, and in the shape, we're also considering whether it is um, heated up, as we said actually, or they have gaps, right? Um, have we defined the statistical descriptor? No, and it's not trivial. So they are, right, because they also need to run several models with the same exquisite special resolution, right? Um, that can be used then to compare with a similar sample of actual observations. And, and it is not trivial. So 
I mean, I'm, I'm just um, passing along the ball to them, <laughs> but they know that that is, that is a very uh, important uh, result. They claim that they will, but to this day, I have not seen the formula that can tell me this is the statistical descriptor, this is the value, these are the error bars, and be, below, below or above this, it has to be warm dark matter, and below it has to be cold dark matter. I still have not seen that. They are working on it, but it's not. But it's, it has not been finalized. It's part of the preparation. But that was a very good point. Thanks. Before I ask the question, I have another question. Sure. <laughs> you showed the image of the piece of sky from Sloan to Sloan Street, the Little Street, etc. What's the approximate size of the yeah, I, I have to come back to you, Alberto, uh, on that one. Uh, I don't want to say too much. I mean, I could just hypothesize that it would be maybe um, a few art minutes, um, but I cannot, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you in detail. I will talk to Alex because he was in charge of doing the simulations, and I will give you the exact area. Okay. My question then is: I think it's still basically. I guess that um, once you go to that depth. And you overimpose over there one of the large galaxies that you are going yeah. to be looking at. Is there any way you can tell whether a clamp that you are seeing is background or perhaps a small satellite of the main galaxy? Or you don't care about that because you only look at the yes. standard things? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And again, a very good question, uh, Alberto. That is, that is uh, precisely who we would like to test in the product uh, proposal. Because you're right, again, at this step, almost every pixel is going um, to have illumination. Right from background, uh, I mean, due to the extension of, of the halos of all the background galaxies, right? And uh, how can we discriminate? Uh, that's why colors, and again, colors we're talking just simply two bands at this moment. For the F mission, uh, again, taking into account the Pathfinder results of the Pioneer mission, if we are awarded such an initial mission, we may have four bands that include ultraviolet, similar to your work in HDF, right? And the importance of having color precisely to distinguish. So we'll have ultraviolet, visible, near-infrared, non-cryogenic, and near-infrared cryogenic. Um, and in addition, we're thinking of having a dichroic. So in a natural way, we already have the design. Uh, we could actually have broadband and a narrow band centered to a specific um, emission lines in each wavelength of the four cases. But that would be the definition for the for the definition. Um, but it is a, again another very good uh, question, and it's something that we need to resolve in products because otherwise we don't have a, a, a tight case actually to present to Pioneer and eventually to to F mission. Yeah. And again, we can talk a little bit more about it because I would love to have your ideas on that one too. Well, uh, I have several questions on myself, but since we have the opportunity later. Uh, yes, I will uh, ask you a question posted on YouTube by a colleague, a colleague of us, uh, Maria Diego, who is uh, right now abroad, and he is uh, making a, actually a long question. So <laughs> you can say that very good talk, and thank you for that. Uh, and he said, uh, in order to be approved, one needs to demonstrate that added value of the mission. By the time Jones is ready to fly, you will we have completed its surveys, reaching similar depth to the fuse object. Can you discuss a bit more the complementary between Jones and the fleet and what new results will Jones bring to the table? Also, <laughs> <laughs> how about in intercluster like uh, in nearby, nearby clusters? The ECL is a good trader to that matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, uh, very good questions, both. Uh, so um, the first one, and it's something that we are uh, discussing with the Euclid team. The Euclid team immediately saw it. And in fact, Alex Borlaev, who has been the guy leading the low surface brightness work within Euclid, immediately said, Rafa, I mean, you guys are, are killing this. Why? Because at the, the, the you saw from the images how different the targets are, right? So Euclid will be looking at the high redshift universe, and by definition, you will be avoiding any bright galaxies nearby in your field of view, by definition. I mean, you're, you're gonna be having actually most of the sky, but you're gonna be avoiding where you have a very large um, object that dominates most of the field. They're not interested in the nearby universe, they're interested in the intermediate redshift universe. 
Um, the depth is about two magnitudes per square, three magnitudes per square second brighter than the limit that we would like to reach. They will have 40 square degrees in which they will go as deep as dunes will go. But they have not selected the fields yet, but most likely they will be cosmological fields, again, trying to avoid bright objects because they don't want the bright objects. They really want to see what's happening at the intermediate object, right? That's why um, the people at, at the EGG and, and Alex at NASA said that it would be very, very complementary in that regard. It's trying to tackle an answer to a question that is very similar, but is answered in a completely different, different way. Um, the intracluster light, yes, absolutely. And in fact, we have been considering as a, as a side project because we will have, um, depending on the lifetime of the, of the, I mean, of the, of the project, um, maybe a year and a half left actually for other type of observations. Mm -hmm. An intracluster light is an obvious one, precisely because it's the same thing. It, one degree field of view fits very well for nearby clusters. And reaching 30 view magnets per square second will give you unprecedented value in the profile of the intercluster light. So um, the only thing is that um, at the intercluster light will not give you the test for the dark matter because it's a completely different um, uh, 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 nature, right? Um, so you need to go to the to the scales of the single gas tables to be able to, to do the test. But the intercluster light per se, down to those limited surface primates is another very interesting project that can be uh, done with the same technology in the same mission. And we are considering doing it. Yeah. But it means that you need these five years to reach the sensitivities for the... No, the no, 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 because um, the nice thing about Pioneer is very, very fast. Uh, typical American. Uh, so, I mean, we are uh, applying next year. We may or may not get it. The only thing I can say is that we're well positioned. Then it's open competition and, and, and the best will win. Um, if we win, that means that um, the funds will be released at the end of next year. And we have seven years to do that, that it will be two years to complete everything. The nice thing is that both the, the platform and the payload have already been demonstrated in space. You still have to build it and test it. But again, it's very reliable. You're not doing this for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's just repeating what has already been done and worked. And then uh, the launch will be in 2024, 2024 at most, right? If we don't get it the first year, everything gets delayed by one year, right? If we get it on the second, of course. Um, and then we will start immediately. Uh, remember that you are having continuous observations of the viewing area. Mm -hmm. So in the first 200 hours after calibration and so on, we will already get the first galaxy. So. It's not that we need five years to get the depth of all the galaxies. No, we will start getting objects every cup, every 200 hours of exposure. And we build the sample yeah. at the center. So that, that's why, in addition, if Euclid would like actually for us to observe very, very deep images of some areas of interest for them, we would love to, we would do it too. Sure. Okay. Okay. I think we already have, I don't know if we have another question. Otherwise, I think we we'll close here. Okay, Thank thanks you. very much to all. Thank you. Sí, sí. Debe estar todavía. ¿Cómo se vio al final?